Hi guys, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to another video which today we're going to be finally starting off Mussolini's policies by taking a look at his social policies. Just like we did with Hitler guys, we're going to be glancing over all of Mussolini's policies from the social, cultural, economic and even political ones. And let me just briefly explain how this video is going to be structured so you have an idea. I'm going to be presenting each individual policy and providing a thorough explanation of each one. And then at the end of each policy, we're going to be looking at the outcomes of that said policy. And then at the end of the video, we're going to be looking at an overall successes and failures for the social policies. And also this is going to be the general format for all of the policies videos from now on. Uh, just so you guys can really understand them uh, really thoroughly so you can ace those exams that are coming up very very quickly just uh, around the corner in May. To be quite honest, there's quite a lot on Mussolini's policies, which means that I don't really know how many videos we're gonna have uh, discussing all of the domestic and foreign policies as well. But with that said, let's just get started with this video and take it one by one each week so we can quickly get it over with, hopefully before your exams in May that are just around the corner. So yeah guys, without further ado, let's get started with this video by starting off with discussing how Mussolini came to the support of the Catholic Church. If you recall to the last video of this channel on Mussolini's consolidation and maintenance of power, which I will link up here or there, I'm not sure on which side, uh, if you haven't watched that video, you will remember that Mussolini rose to the position of dictator at quite a turbulent time in Italian history. He greatly struggled to secure the support of the population following the infamous Matteotti affair and even his own party was starting to turn against him, making claims that if he did not take dictatorial action to settle all of the disputes in Italy, they would support another member of the PNF to rise to the position of Duce instead. Which is why, having secured the position of dictator at this time, it was extremely crucial that he guaranteed the support of some major groups in Italian society. And which other group is more powerful in Italian society than of course the Catholic Church which had been making an influence in Italians lives since the creation of the country itself. Which is why, quickly after having secured the dictatorship, Mussolini moved to establish the support of the church which could be an obvious source of opposition that would undermine his regime. And so, Mussolini implemented a variety of policies that appealed to the church. To list a couple, he made religious education compulsory, which was something that the church wanted for a very very long time, and he even increased the salary of all of the priests around Italy. All of these policies were indeed very successful given that Pope Pius XI quickly renounced the support of the Catholic party and now supported the fascist party instead. And just before I move on to explaining the other major factor that allowed Mussolini to secure the support of the church, I just want to make one quick point that I think is worth keeping in mind. And this is the fact that throughout most of his rise, consolidation, and even now his policies, Mussolini tried very, very hard to secure the unanimous support of the church, or at least guarantee that the church would not oppose him or fascism. And this is because, as we have established, the church was very powerful in Italian society. In his consolidation, for example, Mussolini banned contraception and even helped out the struggling Catholic bank. And now, in his policies, he was even raising the salaries of Italian priests, which just goes to show how powerful the church really was and why it was so important that Mussolini guaranteed his support if he was going to have a long-standing dictatorship in Italy. However, what is also important to highlight is that pretty much all of these policies merely secured some friendly relationships between fascism and the Catholic Church. But there was never a legal agreement drafted between the two in which the church agreed to explicitly support fascism. That was of course until the latter impacts of 1929 which is the next major way that Mussolini was able to secure the unanimous support of the church. Basically, the latter impacts or the latter agreements as it is often called as well were a series of agreements between the PNF and the Catholic Church in which the Pope agreed to officially support fascism and Mussolini as well as recognize Italy as a state which was a matter that had been undecided since the creation of the Italian kingdom back in the 1860s. If you're not familiar with this, I will link up here the long-term causes for the fall of liberal Italy in which we go a little bit into depth about this matter. In return, Mussolini agreed to pay 30 million pounds to the uh, Catholic Church as a thank you for their support, as well as recognize the Vatican as an independent state within the city of Rome. Okay guys, so with that explained, let's take a look at some of the outcomes of these policies that Mussolini implemented to establish the support of the church. In all, the policies were successful in improving the relations between the fascist state and the Catholic Church, but it was very evident that some tensions remained between the two. For example, in 1931, Mussolini was at the height of redesigning the entire education system of Italy. He was reforming the curriculum in public schools to fit the fascist ideology, as well as establishing a variety of youth groups to further indoctrinate the youth on their spare time. However, at the same time, the Catholic Church was propagating its own youth group, the so-called Catholic Action Youth Group, which 
directly interfered and clashed with Mussolini's interest of monopolizing the youth of Italy. We're gonna take a little bit of a deeper look uh, into this matter on our next video when we discuss Mussolini's cultural policies, but it is a good example to keep in mind at this moment when discussing the tensions between Mussolini and the Catholic Church. And of course, another major reason that led to the tensions between Mussolini and the Catholic Church was the rise of anti-Semitism in Italy in 1938, as Italy and Nazi Germany grew closer together in terms of their foreign policies and even ideology. And this nicely links us to the next pieces of social policy that we're going to be discussing, which is of course the rise of anti-Semitism in Italy. So let's take a look at that. A very common and rather popular misbelief about fascism is the notion that anti-Semitism lies at the very heart of the fascist idea which isn't true very much at all. It is true that Nazism is intricately tied to the idea of anti-Semitism, and it is also true that Nazism was derived and was largely influenced by fascism, but to say that fascism encapsulates anti-Semitic ideas isn't very correct, especially because neither Mussolini nor anyone in his government was against the Jewish people. Well, at least not at first. To give you guys some perspective, Italy under Mussolini even opened its borders to around 3,000 fleeing Jews that were attempting to escape the anti-Semitic policies of Nazi Germany. However, by the mid-1930s, two major things happened that reshaped Mussolini's perspective towards the Jewish people. For once, uh, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany began to draw closer in terms of their foreign policy, meaning that a lot of the Nazis' radical racial ideas began to circulate Italy and rub off in many Italians and even Mussolini himself. And the second major reason was that because Mussolini was increasingly exposed to these anti-Semitic ideas, he became increasingly suspicious of the Jewish people in Italy, increasingly seeing them as a threat to his own regime. Especially because it was indeed true that a lot of Jew Italians were members of anti-fascist opposition groups, such as the major opposition group Justice and Liberty, which was led by a Jewish man. And all of these factors together led to the rise of anti-Semitism in fascist Italy by 1938. In November of this same year, Mussolini passed a policy that stated that Jews could not marry non-Jews as an attempt to preserve the racial purity of the Italian people. And whilst it is important to highlight that these policies were very much uh, pertinent and prominent in fascist Italy, they were nowhere as radical as they were in Nazi Germany, with Mussolini even excluding a variety uh, of Jews from these anti-Semitic policies. For example, he was so uh, fond of the idea of militarism and so uh, thankful for those that had fought in World War One that all of the Jews that had fought for Italy in the First World War were exempted from these anti-Semitic policies. Alright guys, so now let's take a look at some of the outcomes of these anti-Semitic policies that Mussolini was establishing. Thankfully, to be quite honest, the persecution of the Jewish people in fascist Italy was very inconsistent and very ineffective, which meant that it was uh, not done to a very great extent. And this was primarily because although anti-Semitic policies existed and were implemented, they were not properly enforced by the law or even by the Italian people. This was mainly due to the Catholic Church's opposition to anti-Semitism as the Catholic Church would speak out against these anti-Semitic policies and followers of Catholicism would indeed listen to the Pope. And also because a lot of Italians were very close to Jews and a lot of Italians were close to Italian Jews as well, which meant that people were not very quick to turn on their neighbors when Mussolini simply stated that anti-Semitic policies were now established in the country. Even then, the damage to the Jewish community was created under Mussolini. By 1943, with the fall of the fascist regime, Mussolini gave in to the more radical wing of the fascist party that called for a more uh, radical approach to the Jewish people of Italy, much like what the Nazis were doing in Nazi Germany. Which is why Mussolini seized a bunch of Jewish property all across the country and even sent around 7.5 thousand Jews to Nazi concentration camps, only around 600 of which managed to survive. Moving on from that guys, there was also another very important group that Mussolini needed to dedicate some time in order to devise some very specific social policies if he was going to achieve some uh, other major social and even economic goals. And of course, this group was the women in Italy. So now let's take a look at some of Mussolini's policies towards women. Much like the Catholic Church itself, Mussolini believed that in order to restore Italy's greatness, Italian society and even the nation in its entirety had to return to its traditional self, which subsequently meant the return of traditional gender roles, where men were expected to go to war and even to war in times of conflict, whereas women were expected to stay home cooking and taking care of their 
their kids. And so, Mussolini implemented a series of policies that attempted to push women into these traditional gender roles that the fascist party had devised as desirable for the nation. For example, he banned contraception in order to increase the number of kids that each woman would have, further tying them to their home rather than to the workplace and forcing them to stay at home taking care of these kids. And similarly, women were amply discouraged to join higher education in order to pursue a career in life later on, as again they were uh, highly encouraged to stay at home taking care of their own family and taking care of their own environment whilst waiting for their husband to come back to work. However, even though all of these policies were indeed necessary to force women into societal roles that were expected by a fascist society, they were also crucial to Mussolini's major social policy of boosting the Italian population in order to properly nurture the expansion of the Italian Empire, which was supposed to be done through the so-called Battle of the Birds, which is a major policy that Mussolini attempted to implement. So let's take a look at the Battle of the Birds and how women were integrally tied to it. In essence, the Battle of the Birds was a policy that Mussolini came up with in 1927 with the main goal being to massively boost the Italian population to 60 million people by the year of 1950. Mussolini had the dream of massively expanding the Italian Empire all across the world, which is why a huge Italian population was necessary in order to make this dream come true. And so, in order to properly implement the Battle of the Birds, Mussolini came up with a variety of carrot and stick approaches that would incite women to have more kids and thus increase the Italian population. So let's take a look at what these measures were and how they exactly swayed women into having more kids. One of the main ways that Mussolini convinced women to have more children was by exempting all families that had six or more kids from any sort of taxation, which was naturally a major economic benefit especially for those families that were of lower income. Also, the fascist state invested on a massive propaganda campaign that essentially said that good Italians were those that had more and more babies. Also, by the 1930s, even people's careers were being affected by the Battle of the Birds, given that people in the civil service were only allowed to get promotions or raises if they had at least one child. And also, Mussolini even went as far as interfering in the labor market to properly propagate the Battle of the Birds. In 1933, he set a quota that limited the amount of women that could join the public workforce to only 10%. Yet, of course, this exempted lower paying roles like maids or waitresses, which uh, the fascists still expected should be done by women, as men were unworthy of these lower ranking positions, of course. Uh, okay, guys, so now let's take a look at some of the outcomes of these policies towards women, which, spoiler alert, were very unsuccessful for the fascists and for Mussolini. For once, in spite of Mussolini's great efforts of uniting couples and encouraging them to have kids, the very opposite occurred as marriage rates only declined and so did birth rates up until 1936. So much so that by 1950, Mussolini's goal of an Italian population of 60 million still remained only a dream as the Italian population was only of 47.5 million people. And even so, Mussolini's interventionist policies proved to be a failure. His quota on the labor market proved to be essentially inexistent as by 1936, 33% of the workforce were made up of women simply because employers were unwilling to discriminate between men and women for their desired position which they just wanted to be filled up by a competent worker. And of course, rather than recognizing that his policies were simply a failure, Mussolini blames the lack of Italian patriotism and the failure of his policies after the Second World War. Alright guys, so this closes off this section on the video on the social policies towards women and of course now we have to discuss the next major group in Italian society that the fascists had to focus in order to properly take care of Italy's future. And this is of course the Italian youth, which is the next group that we're going to be discussing. Much like the way we discussed the policies towards the youth in Nazi Germany, in this video we're going to be breaking down the policies into two major categories. The first are those policies that were directed towards the education system of Italy and the second were those that were directed towards the fascist youth groups which were another major way of indoctrinating the children of Italy. So now let's take a look at fascist schools and how the school curriculum was devised in order to propagate the fascist way of life for the newly formed fascist youth. Much like the Nationalist Socialist Teachers League that was created in Nazi Germany to keep tabs on all of the teachers of Nazi Germany, the fascist state had the Fascist Teachers Association created in 1931 and made compulsory in 1937 for all of the teachers in Italy. This organization forced all of the teachers of Italy to take an oath, swearing they would be loyal and serve the state and only the fascist state. It also existed to regulate all of the teachers and ensure that the indoctrination of the youth was being done in a proper manner, very similar to what the National Socialist Teachers League would do in Nazi Germany. 
In fact, guys, just before I move on to explaining how schools operated in fascist Italy, I'm going to be linking up here in the card on whichever side it is, our video where we talk about the Nazi education system because it is worth keeping in mind the great similarities between the education system of Nazi Germany and of fascist Italy as well. Especially because a lot of what we talk about um, in this video when we discuss the education system in Italy came before Hitler even rose to power in 1933, meaning that a lot of what we're discussing here actually influenced the Nazi policies towards the youth, which we know were indeed very effective. But anyways, back to fascist schools. The school system was very much centered around Mussolini's code of personality, or the coach of fascismo for that matter. Only textbooks that were approved by the state were uh, allowed to be displayed in classrooms and kids were taught to venerate Mussolini. After all, he was indeed the hero that had been sent to restore Italian greatness to the same extent and glory that he had formerly seen during the Roman Empire. Mussolini was at the same status as great emperors like Caesar or Aurelius, which is why he was indeed adored by the Italian youth. Yet Italian superiority was also greatly emphasized in the school curriculum. The works of great Italian men like Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and even Marco Polo were cited as evidence for Italy's greatness in Europe, and kids were taught that it was the great Italian mind that had come up with some of the most remarkable achievements in humankind. However, when we look at the outcome of these fascist schools, we see that the indoctrination of the youth was only done to a very limited extent, and this was because of two major reasons. The first major reason was that a significant proportion of kids left school at age 11 in order to help out taking care of their younger siblings at home or even to work in factories to further increase their family income. And the second is that this very well thought out fascist curriculum to propagate the fascist ideology was only present in the public schools of Italy. Meaning that the kids that attended the Catholic schools or even the private schools of the country were exempted from all of this indoctrination that had been devised by the state. However, Mussolini hoped to battle the shortcomings of the fascist education system with the youth movements that were spread all across the country. So let's take a look at these youth movements and to what extent they were actually successful in indoctrinating the youth as well. Mussolini sought to indoctrinate the youth in their leisure time as well, encouraging them to be athletic, aggressive, and very disciplined fascists, which he hoped would be qualities that would would uh, eventually make up good soldiers in the time of war. And for that, in 1926, he founded the Opera Nazionale Ballela, or the ONB, which was open and compulsory for all children aged 8 to 18 in the country. By 1937, over 7 million children had joined the ONB, and by then the organization had grown to such a great extent that activities between boys and girls were split up in order to emphasize their particular desirable traits in a fascist society. For example, boys would engage in military training and training on the fascist ideology in order to properly build up their physical strength and, and fascist mindset, both of which were keen for a good soldier in society. On their contrary, girls would engage in activities such as singing, cooking, and even sewing as well, which would be desirable of a fascist woman. And also, something else that is interesting to keep in mind, which is not a youth movement but kind of fits into this category as well, was that Mussolini was able to even penetrate higher education by creating the Gruppi Universitari Fascisti or the GUF, which was a fascist university that mainly taught the higher ranking or advanced version of fascist ideology. Okay guys, so now let's take a look at some of the outcomes of the ONB and of fascist youth movements as a whole. Overall, although the ONB was compulsory, it was never fully enforced by the state, meaning that while kids were highly encouraged and expected to join the youth movement, there were not fascist officials roaming about Italy uh, making sure that all kids would participate in the activities, meaning that a lot of kids did not go to the ONB and was thus uh, exempted from the indoctrination that there occurred. And also, for those that did attend the ONB, the fascist indoctrination that there took place was very limited and very uh, superficial indeed, meaning that very few of the ideology actually rub off on the kids. And many of the children only attended the youth movements because they would do uh, fun activities like playing soccer and other sports. And also guys, here we face a key methodological issue that is very hard to get around, which is pinpointing exactly how many people were uh, indoctrinated by the ONB. Because indoctrination took place in a variety of different formats in uh, fascist Italy, from posters to uh, fascist schools to theaters to a bunch of different things, it is really hard to pinpoint the effects of the ONB in its exact form, which is also an issue that we face when we talk about uh, the Hitler Youth, for example, in Nazi Germany, given that indoctrination was being done to a great extent in a variety of different places in Nazi Germany. 
Okay guys, so with that said, now let's take a look at some of the successes and failures of all of these policies that we talked about, and I'll make it really brief because this video is already massive. Honestly, I think the only success that we can draw out of this was the Lateran Agreement with ease some of the tensions between the church and the fascist state, although even these are very limited because of how some tensions still remain even after the Lateran Pact. Okay, but onto the failures, Mussolini's relationship with the church really deteriorated over time, especially following the implementation of the youth movements and the anti-Semitic policies policies which started to displace some of the clashing interests between the fascist state and the Catholic Church. Moving on, the anti-Semitic policies were amply ineffective given that although they were implemented they were never enforced, a very similar problem to the ONB like we just discussed where even though it was a thing that the government expected people to do, people didn't actually do them, which is why anti-Semitism wasn't actually really uh, pertinent in Italian society. Also, all of Mussolini's policies towards women were a major failure. But decline and so did marriage rates and the goals of the battle of the birth never fully materialized with the policy itself also being a major failure. Finally just to close off the education system and the OMB were indeed major failures with them never actually fully indoctrinating the youth to the extent that Mussolini and the fascist party wanted. You could say that there was some successes with the fascist uh, education system with the notion of Italian superiority and Mussolini's uh, depiction of a hero being indeed uh, properly proper propagated to the youth, but I would say that overall it was a major failure. We simply have to compare how the youth was being indoctrinated in fascist Italy and in Nazi Germany, given that we see that in Nazi Germany it was much more pertinent and much more effective as Hitler and the Nazis truly managed to completely transform uh, the youth's mindset to the extent that people were uh, spying and reporting on their parents to the state. None of this occurred in fascist Italy, which shows the disparity of the effectiveness of the social policies towards the youth in these two different authoritarian states. Alright guys, so with all that said, we have finally closed off this massive, massive video. We haven't really had a video of this length in quite a while in this channel, which is why uh, I don't blame you if you got tired along the way or if you phased out, it's totally understandable. Just make sure that you rewatch the parts that you didn't quite get so you can truly get the notes down and ace these exams that I know are just around the corner. With that said guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I truly hope you have found this informative and as always, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any doubts, questions or concerns. You can do so through the comment section down below, through my email ibwithian at gmail.com or also through my Instagram as I am frequently active over there at ibwithian. Please stay tuned for the future videos on this channel as we're starting to branch out onto other pieces of content such as the EE uh, and even economics which might be coming soon on the horizon just as the big for you guys. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm gonna keep covering most of these policies as much as I can before the exams that are coming up now in May. So hopefully we'll have a bunch of the content covered uh, for your exams, uh, which are really, really soon. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because that truly helps us out here as we're doing a lot of work to make sure that you get the best revision possible. And as always, please use my notes over here, which I've been providing throughout the entirety of the video and they are also linked down below. I encourage you to check out the link on the description because there you can also find uh, the full set of notes for the economic and political and cultural policies as well, uh, just in case you wanna get a head start in revising those before the other videos come out. With that said guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.